Yeah. Welcome Facebook Live. So we're here talking tequila today. Uh, tequila, because um, it's Cinco de Mayo coming up. Cinco de Mayo is just two days away. And uh, of course, Cinco de Mayo is more like Drinco de Mayo. People are out there drinking lots of tequila. And tequila is one of those, um, one of those spirits that I think is really misunderstood. And there's a lot behind tequila that we really don't know about. Um, I'm here today with Mike. Say hi, Mike. Hello. Mike is uh, from an awesome uh, spirit company, uh, Blueprint Spirits, that operates here in New York and several other states across the country, connected to um, Craft Beer Guild, which is also Union Beer. So Mike has an awesome lineup of all different boutique uh, gins, spir- gins, vodkas, whiskeys, bourbons, and yes, tequilas. So we are here going to talk Cinco de Mayo tequilas. So I made a post yesterday on Facebook uh, with two new tequilas that we got in, and and I quickly mentioned the diffuser method on tequila, how the diffuser method is one of those things that not many people are talking about, and the ones that are talking about it are saying that it's the greatest thing ever because they're saving agave, and then the people who aren't doing it say, no, 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 you don't want to be using the diffuser method when you make tequila. So let's talk about that right off the bat, Mike, about diffuser method. Um, and it's one of those things that you really don't hear often. You don't hear anybody really talking about it. I've never heard a salesman come in and say, I have non-diffuser tequila. Uh, well, first, a diffuser is a, it's a high-efficiency uh, piece of machinery that's used to make a lot of, a lot of tequila in a short amount of time. Um, it, uh, it, it's used by most of the national brands, or it's, I should say it's a method that's used by a lot of national brands. Um, I think Sousa has it on their website, and they have a video on. I think that's one of the... Okay. Because you really can't... You, you, you'll, you'll do Google searches, and not much comes up. Yeah, I actually have some information that I'll send to you that's pretty educational. But really, um, in, in my experience, everybody's palate is different, but I think that the diffuser method, it, it allows you to make a lot of product in a short amount of time. Um, so what you get in a higher yield, you sometimes sacrifice in body and texture. Can we, can we say it's like olive oil, the first extra virgin pressing compared to the second, third, or fourth pressing? Where they're pulling it, yes. more things out of the olive oil, it, or like maple syrup, where they're tapping the tree too late in the season to get all that in every drop they can and producing a lower quality maple syrup. It is. It, 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 what it's doing is it's stripping the agave of its natural sugars, which, you, which is what you want in tequila production. But the method of, of which it's doing it is, is stripping it of its body and its texture as well. You, some people may disagree with me on that, depending on who you ask. Um, but that is, by nature, how it works. Uh, it, it's a large piece of machinery, almost the size of this room, uh, maybe a little bit longer. Um, that it, there's also an autoclave method and natural brick ovens. Natural brick ovens is, is uses steam. Now you can find stuff on natural brick ovens. If you find if you Google like brick oven mm-hmm. tequila, you'll see some brands come up and claim that they're doing that. Some yep. very nice brands. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're getting more basically they're getting more agave nectar, more agave juice, and from what it sounds like, this fuser is are basically mechanically extracting, Correct. breaking the fibers down even further than just a regular pressing. Now, some distilleries are using the Tohono wheel, right. which I grinded in. Um, that, was the, that was the way you did it for, I guess, decades, right? Centuries almost, mm-hmm. um, to make tequila through the Tohono that's, wheel. That's how Dulce Vita is made. Okay. There was a, a horse-driven uh, Tohono wheel. Yes, which not many of those distilleries exist. Yeah. Because it's all mechanicalized, uh, done by machine. So I guess it's basically a, a way of mechanically extracting as much as you basically can out of that agave as possible. Yes. Um, go to Sousa's website. They're going to claim that it's the best thing ever. Now, Sousa was sold back in the 60s to a big company, and it's when it sold again and sold again. Uh, the original Sousa uh, plantation now operates and, and um, distillery operates as Fortaleza which the great-grandson took over and opened up the museum and started making tequila again, but the great-grandfather sold it to a big company. So whenever you see the Sousa name... Now, this is a point that a lot of people don't understand because they say, oh, I love this tequila. I love this brand. I love this brand. All right, and I really don't like this brand. But a lot of times, 
all those brands that they like are sometimes made in the same factory or distillery yeah. or factory at that point. You know, last time I checked, I think there were 1,600 brands of tequila and maybe only 100 distilleries. Yeah. Something like that, correct? If you go to tequila.net, tequila.net, have you ever been to tequila.net? Yeah, great website. I don't even think there's an app for it on the phone. They get really in-depth with where your tequila is coming from and the ratings of it. Um, so, for example, like Sammy Hagar, he didn't build a tequila distillery and a whole thing. He just went to a factory and said, hey, I want my own label. Make my own label for me. Uh, it, just, can, it can be compared to uh, whiskey, whiskey producers buying their whiskey from MGP ingredients. It, it's it, similar. Right. So anybody can go to these factories and say, hey, I want my own rye or my own whiskey or my own tequila. Mm -hmm. Whether you have a recipe or not, they're going to make it for you. If you have a recipe, you can say, oh, it's my great-grandfather's recipe or it's the family recipe. But if you don't have a recipe, they're going to say, hey, here's our basic lineup of, an, of a tequila or a basic lineup of rye. In MGK, M, MGP's case, it's a 95.5 blend. Um, so you just slap your own label on and start marketing it as your own tequila. When, in fact, you've never owned a tequila, an agave field. You might have never even seen agave in your life out in the field. Mm -hmm. um, and you might not know much about it, and but yet you have your own tequila line. And some people say, oh, I love this tequila, not really knowing that it's just a made-up brand, a made-up distillery. A, somebody else is actually doing that for that company. Yeah. So the, the stuff you're showing me comes from, now it's called NOM numbers, N-O-M. And I'm not sure what N-O-M stands for, but it's some kind of numerical numbering system of the distilleries in Mexico. I don't know if you can add on to that, but I go by non number, we it's, call it. it. It's just basically the identification number of where, of the distillery that it's made in. Right, and you can see the NOM number on each bottle. See that right there, NOM, and it'll say the NOM number 1440, 1443. So if you go to tequila.net and look up NOM 1443, they're gonna tell you all about this distillery and what other brands they make. Now, sometimes you'll find a NOM that literally lists 40 different tequila products that are coming out of that factory. And then you'll find a NOM that there might only be one single brand coming out of there, which is that family's particular brand. And it's that family's, you know, that, that, that family's in the tequila business. Yeah. They're not in the mass production business of throwing other people's labels on their tequila or recipes. Um, mezcal versus tequila. A lot of people say, oh, I love mezcal, or I don't drink mezcal, but I like tequila. And from my understanding, every single tequila classifies as a mezcal, right? Because is mezcal a blanket statement for that type of spirit, but mezcal yet can be something different in its own, different, different in its own with a different agave they use? I believe or, it can be a different species of plant, but it's also a different by the way that it's cooked, by the way that the agave is cooked. Okay. Um, a lot of agaves are, or I'm sorry, a lot of mezcals are smoke bombs. They are. Um, it's like a whiskey almost. Yeah. Whiskey-ish. Um, some of them actually have, have a guy down in the pit that's, that's scraping off the char. Okay. So you get more of the, so you get more of the pure agave. Okay. Um, during the distillation process, there's also uh, heads, tails, and hearts, just like anything you distill with tequila. And a lot of tequilas will take the tails and dump it in the next batch to create a higher yield. Okay. Uh, but heads and tails are a byproduct that are poisonous to the body, which, which is what causes a hangover when you drink. <coughs> if you drink a low, a low quality, <coughs> low price point tequila or mezcal, um, and it, it has a, a rubbing alcohol or fingernail polish remover, um, flavor profile to it or texture that's from those tails uh, from that distillation process and part of the diffuser that also contributes to that end product being very uh, a, very uh, uh, like rubbing alcohol like rubbing alcohol okay um, does that make sense that okay that makes sense that makes sense so let's talk about the different composition of what goes into tequila mm -hmm. if something doesn't say hundred percent agave tequila it's what else could they be putting in it uh that's a good question i'm not <laughs> sure at that, that point it would be an agave spirit i i think because you can call it like a, you can call it tequila yeah. but unless it says a hundred percent uh of agave yeah then i think by law 51 percent agave 51 percent agave and 49 percent other sugars yeah so that's a common thing that well tequilas are in restaurants the stuff on the back shelf hopefully is 100% agave. That's the stuff they're showing off. Mm -hmm. But the stuff that's in the well on the bottom that they're mixing to mixing margaritas with, yeah, that stuff could be 49% corn syrup. 
Yeah, there's 51% also, there's also caramel color added, which is where you get the term gold from, which is not... It's just a sexier term than, than caramel color added. Right. So that's a good point, because like Cuervo has a gold, and they have a silver. It's the same tequila, mm -hmm. just with caramel color adding, basically yeah. food coloring adding. It's the same exact tequila, and a lot of places do that. Now let's talk about a true silver versus a true reposado versus a true anejo. Because mm -hmm. this here is an anejo, yeah, and this would be the equivalent of a silver, right? Because that's that's unaged. Clear, unaged. Yeah. So that number three is aged twelve months in bourbon barrels. That's organic. Uh, it's all natural. Um, these are organic as well. So here you have all three. You actually have a blanco or a silver. Uh -huh. Then we have a reposado, which is going to be aged in, in barrels as well. See the color difference on that, folks. And then to the next one, which is the Reposado, gets a little more aging, so that's a little darker. So these are not to be confused with a gold tequila with the caramel or the coloring added to it. Correct. So these are actually getting their coloring from the oak. <clears throat> and they're getting much more, I don't want to say much more complexity, but they're getting a different flavor. Yeah. Because some people love silver, um, and that's their thing. And some people like a sipping tequila, which they might say, well, they might equivalent, uh, you know, say, well, an anejo is something that I'm going to sip and enjoy as opposed to something I'm going to do a shot of. But that's just a general rule, and I don't just hold true with if you hold that belief. Um, but that's what we typically find here in the restaurant. People order an aged tequila if they want to just sit there and, 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 and sip on it. Um, personally, in margaritas, do you have a preference of a, a silver reposado or anejo? I prefer silver, but that's me. So I've gone back and forth on this. I've gone back and forth. I used to like a reposado in a, in a margarita. Mm -hmm. But then, and I did that for a long time. Now I like silvers because of the more crispness. Mm -hmm. And I think the acidity that's in the silver that gives that, just helps that, that margarita just give it a, big, a bigger um, zing to it or better balance. Um, so I've gone back and forth. I can see how people can like reposado because I really like reposado for years. And I guess it really depends on what tequila you're putting in yeah. the margarita as well. Um, I think we've talked a lot about uh, the diff we talked about the diffuser method. We talked about aging. We talked about what goes into tequila. Um, we talked about uh, the non numbers, which is super important. Folks, go to tequila.net and check out the check out your favorite tequila. Plug that non number in there again. Go on the back of the tequila bottle. And you will see the nom number. They're always on every single one by law. They have to be. Um, I'm not sure where this one is. Oh, right there it is. Right there is a nom number on this one. Uh, so they are on all bottles. <clears throat> Check out your favorite tequila. And see, you might be shocked to find out that your favorite tequila might be made by Jose Cuervo. Uh, Cuervo could indeed be making your favorite tequila that does not look like a Jose Cuervo bottle at all. Um... When you, uh, when you talk about diffuser tequilas as well, you can also compare that to, you know, as a chef, you know, if you, if you slow cook something, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot more tender and have a lot more uh, fuller flavor than if you, some, if you put something in the microwave. If you're speeding up the process and you're not allowing it to go through its natural process, that, that can compromise the body and the texture and the quality of your end product. Absolutely. So we have a question here. Do they have stevia-based tequilas or just purely agave? Stevia would be nice because uh, stevia has health benefits to it, and people substitute stevia in into a lot of beverages because there, it has a zero glycemic index. However, tequila is based on agave production, not on stevia. And I'm not even sure if you could distill the stevia because the stevia really doesn't have any sugar in it to, to I, I distill. I've heard of tequilas that use stevia. Yeah, you might you might get a, a tequila that that has a stevia. F, um, additional sweetener in it, but that might, that, I, I'm not sure if that would be called a tequila cocktail or something, or an agave cocktail, yeah. um, some kind of something like that, but tequilas are made from agave. Agave is from Mexico, where tequila is made. Stevia is from South America, I believe. I believe Colombia, countries like that grow, that's where stevia really comes from. You can grow stevia here in the Northeast. You have to wait until the end of May to put it in the ground. The soil has to be 50 degrees or more. We always grow two or three stevia plants here at Aroma Time and back, and they grow to about six feet tall. Uh, and you can go out there and just chew them, and they're really super sweet. You dry them yourselves, you just add a couple leaves to your tea, and it'll sweeten your tea right up. Now, unlike bourbon, whiskey, gin, vodka, 
tequila has to come from Mexico and has to come from Jalisco specifically, yeah. is that right? So tequila is totally 100% regional based, just like cognac can only from, come from cognac France, Armagnac can only come from Armagnac. That were champagne. champagne only from Champagne. Tequila can only come from Jalisco, from Mexico. It is totally regional. So you're not going to find an American-made tequila, which is one of the reasons, going back to why there's so many tequila factories uh, and there's many, many more brands of tequila because we couldn't set up a distillery here in New York and make tequila. We actually have to go to Jalisco, uh, to Mexico, and contract with one of the manufacturers there. And it's much easier for us to contract with a factory than to build our own distillery. We would never do that. Uh, anybody in America really won't do that. So you have to go partner with somebody there, and that's how. That's why there's 1,600 brands and only 100 distilleries because that's the deal and that's what's happening. Anything else before we uh, dive into tasting? Do you have a preference of for Cinco de Mayo, or you want, is there a specific brand here you want to talk about? Um, I liked also Vita and the one, two, three organic. Uh, a common question that I get is how long is the agave grown? Yes. Um, they're grown about nine years, and they can get up to about 200 and 250 pounds. Wow. So they get pretty big. Those are monsters. They call the, the agave plant is nicknamed the century plant. Because I guess some of them can get extremely old. I'm not sure if they actually get a century old, a hundred years old, but I guess some of them do grow for a, an extended amount of time. If you have uh, if you have agave grown in the highlands, that is going to result in a sweeter tequila. Okay. The lowlands, lowlands is going to be a little more earthy. This is really smooth. <clears throat> so this is the Dolce Vita organic tequila. Ooh. Right? Yeah, that's yummy. This is really good. Any particular story about them? Any other information you have about Dolce Vita? Uh, they are, they're imported through Austin, Texas. Uh, the agave used, mm. again, is nine years old. Um, the Reposado is aged for eight months. The Añejo is aged for uh, 18 months. <coughs> that's yummy. That is really good. Any. You're also going to get more, uh, they use more of the heart versus the tails. Okay. Very minimal tails are used. That's going to give you a more pure tequila. So you don't have the rubbing alcohol finish on the back end. It also results in a, not as bad of a hangover if you, if you overindulge. <coughs> tequila is one of those things people have a, a love-hate relationship with. Yeah. And sometimes they hate it because they used to love it a little well, too much. Usually if people don't like tequila, in my experience, it's because they had a bad experience. Yes. In high school or college. Shots. <laughs> and their smell sensory triggers that memory. But what a lot of people don't realize is that um, what they're smelling is the tails. And that's, the, that's what's a toxin to your body. Uh, that's the methanol alcohol. That's the tails that's dumped back in. And that's what's triggering that memory. So if you have something that's a more pure tequila, then this is only the heart. It, it gives you a much cleaner finish. This tequila is super clean. I mean, this is really smooth. Yeah. Um, you know, and unfortunately, a lot of people have their bad tequila experiences in high school, <laughs> yeah. in college. When they're not out buying a premium bottle of tequila, they're at a party that somebody went and bought. Who even knows if it's 100% agave tequila? None of these have the little, what is it on the bottom? The, do they even put that in? The worm? the worm? Worm goes in the mezcal yeah. typically, right? Yeah. And it's only a one or two it, brands. It's not a scorpion, it's a It's a, me it's a, it's a worm that eats, yeah. right, that eats something. These, uh, uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen that's, that. I haven't that's seen more, that that's mezcals. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it's a marketing when ploy. When we were younger, obviously. When we were younger, yeah, everyone wanted to go buy the bottle with the worm in it. You don't care what it tastes like. Yeah. It was just the first person to get the worm, like, right? right? It was a they, rite of passage. Yes. Right. You had to fight to get the worm. Yeah. I never got the yeah, worm. It was um, a worm? It's a worm. I feel like it was it's a worm. worm. And it's supposed to I eat think something. I particular brand that used a scorpion. That's not... It was. Okay. And you had to... Supposedly that, supposedly that, that worm ate something um, medicinal or hallucinogenic. And if you, you got to the worm, <laughs> you were going to you know, feel that much extra special. But if you drank that much tequila, you're going to feel that much extra special anyway. Yeah. Um, so, so this bottle 
Yeah. This is also available on 80 proof and 100 proof. This is the 80 proof. 80 proof, okay. So 80 proof means that it's going to have more uh, purified water added to it than 100 proof. Okay. I'm assuming this is going to be about 35 bucks retail. 30 to 35. 30 to 30. Yeah. Rep the Reposado? Uh, that one is about, I would say, 35 to 38. Okay. The Añejo is around <coughs> 37 to 40. Did you get the Reposado yet? Now we're on to the Añejo. Mm -hmm. Some tequilas will be aged in bourbon barrels, um, dry barrels. It's mostly bourbon barrels. Uh, used bourbon barrels from different distilleries around the country. I just went out of order. I skipped. We went, now we're on to the three. What's the name of this one? One, two, two three, three. One, two, three, three organic. I missed, organic. I missed the Reposado from That's Dolce the Vita. That's the Anejo. Anejo, I mean Anejo. I went right to the Anejo here. And Jamie, this is numbered one, two, and three. Three being Anejo, two being Reposado, one oh, being the that's silver. And it's organic? It's organic. Yeah. And you said this is probably your best selling one? The one, two, yeah, three? Yeah, that's, that's our top selling brand. Okay. Mm. I'm really excited. That's what I'm tasting right now. That's what you're tasting right now, yes. They also make the cranium as cow. Ooh. Okay. It's got some caramel. Caramel. Yeah. Some caramel, but yet really smooth. Yeah. Folks, like tequila doesn't have to burn. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it really doesn't. That, again, that burn is from None the tail. None of these are burning. I mean, if, not one. If you if you get the burn, that's usually an indication of a diffuser tequila. Diffuser and tequila. It's an indication that the tails were dumped into that batch. Interesting. We're gonna go back to the inhaler. We're gonna go back. That's got a really nice caramel. Uh, that comes from bourbon. You said this goes in bourbon barrels, or would, you, would this goes this going to Those three? Are used in bourbon barrels. Bourbon barrels. Can I have a dump cup, please? Absolutely. So, now to the Dolce Vita Reposado. Anejo. Anejo, Anejo, Anejo. Thank you, Jamie, for the correction. Um, which is your glass? Again, super smooth. More subtle than the one we tasted before. Delicious. There's no burn on any of these. These, these are these are delicious. These no, are really that, that tingle on very your tongue, smooth. But like, just from that, you can taste that the barrel. You know, you can taste a little bit more of the the oak, right? Is it oak barrels? <coughs> oak barrels. Yeah. Now, now, number three was bourbon. All right, folks. We have a couple more tequilas to taste. Um, I'm gonna turn the camera off now. Leave some comments on your favorite tequila uh, here. Small brand. Just in general, your favorite tequila. And uh, then take that tequila and look it up on, um, on tequila.net and find out some more about it. Tequila.net's a great resource. I like to use it when I go out to a bar and somebody's touting this super luxury, high premium tequila and this and that. I go right up to tequila.net and I can tell the bartender more about that tequila than the bartender knows about it, which is interesting. Um, now, we have about a dozen tequilas here, Jamie. We're going to have another, probably add another three on to our, our menu today through, during this tasting. The neat thing is there's a Mexican restaurant right down the street from us here, Gabby's. He has 150 tequilas. He doesn't have one tequila that we have. We don't have one that he has, and we only have 12 or 15 um, tequilas. So it's really neat that that um, a Mexican restaurant with that many tequilas has nothing that we have. And the reason is because we're buying from these small distributors that are getting us some really cool stuff. I like to call our, our bar here at Aroma Time Bistro the anti-corporate headquarters. It's all about smaller smaller production, more family-run operations, distilleries from around the world, or smaller type businesses that are operating in a community that are, that are, that are providing real jobs in a real community and um, doing, making a difference as opposed to buying from a massive factory like Diageo or something. Is Diageo in the tequila business? They are, aren't they? Diageo used to distribute. They used well, to Diageo's sales. not a factory. They're, uh, they're a... Uh, uh, the devil. The, they have their hands in everything. They used to. They used to have the sales rights for Cuervo, but they don't anymore. Yeah, 
Um, they own both. They they own a lot of different brands from a lot of different categories. Yeah, they own brands like uh, Constellation Brands. Um, they own a lot of the top whiskeys like Lagavulin. They own Diageo. Like Johnny Walker. They own Johnny Walker. See, so, you now here's that's a great point, Johnny Walker. So the reason why we don't like to buy from the big guys, especially Diageo, when Di- these big companies buy brands, they buy other companies, they buy brands, and they usually like they like to disassemble what's going on. So, for example, Johnny Walker had 700 employees in a town in Scotland. Diageo buys them, takes them over, and Diageo says, well, we don't need the real estate. We don't need the employees. We don't need anything there because we're going to take their product, Johnny Walker, and distill it in one of our main distilleries and make it and blend it there. So what they do, they laid off 700 people in a small town in Scotland. Distillery shut down. It's like what Budweiser did when they bought Rolling Rock. Hundreds of people lost their job at La Trobe. These big companies don't want the real estate, folks. They don't want the building. They don't want the employees. Even though Bacardi's family owned, it's you know, the Bacardi family down there in Puerto Rico, they have 200 production facilities. No, I'm sorry, 27 production facilities and 200 brands they make, 200 different products they make out of 27 production facilities. So for them, you, it's, like, it's, like, it's like strategically doing a chess game. Let's take this brand and buy it and stick it over with all these other brands that we're making in a factory somewhere where we can make the product we, you know, instead of using 50 people, we can use three people. And that's the way a lot of this consolidation happens. There was a burger company here, Sunshine Burger. Uh, Carol was here for 25 years. She was making Sunshine Burgers right around the corner here. And she had a dozen employees. A big company bought them, moved the production to Maryland, and in a four-hour shift with one person, they can do what they're doing all week here because everything's done on machines and automated. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a single malt that, uh, that I will not name, but there's a single malt distillery that employs about 80% of the town that it's in. And the owner of that, they do everything by hand. They don't do anything with machines. Um, and the owner of that distillery will the distillery to the town upon his passing because he doesn't have any children. And the one uh, person in his family next of kin apparently, uh, allegedly, is not a very nice person. So uh, instead of giving it to him, He's willing to the town so that the town can maintain their infrastructure um, with the condition that they never that it's never sold to a larger conglomerate. Beautiful. That's so, great. Now those are the those are the types of uh, suppliers that we work with. That's great. Now, Tunneltown, seven years ago, they had an Just agreement. Got the story. Literally five minutes before I came in here got the story. Really? Somebody, an employee was in the parking lot and gave me the story. Really? So they had to redo the whole thing again. It wasn't what we think it is. It wasn't in seven years ago, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, from what the story we got, seven years ago they did do a... They sold the sales rights to their Hudson Whiskey to William, William, right. William and Grant. Right. Right, so they did do that to William and Grant. And people said, oh, Marcus, but they're William and Grant now. Thought you don't support big brands. And I said, you're right, I don't like to support big brands. But here's the one difference. They make a couple other products. I like their, I like their, their vodka, I like their triple sec, I like their cacao liqueur. Uh, Ralph's a great guy. We know Ralph personally. Ralph still owned or owns the distillery. He still owns the property. He just, as much whiskey as he can make, has to go to William Grant and Sons. And I said, they're still employing local people. But the day that they stop making the whiskey there and they take away from the local workforce is the day that I have to reevaluate if I'm buying them or not anymore. Yeah. The money still goes to Ralph. Ralph still gets paid for every bottle he makes, but it goes to William and Grant now. And William and Grant is the ones who say, okay, we're going to take your product and go globally with this. We're going to Japan, we're going to England, we're going to, to wherever, Dubai, Singapore. We're taking your product everywhere across the world. That, that, that William Grant has products in. And, you know, Brooklyn Beer did the same thing with Heineken. Mm-hmm. Except Brooklyn got paid like $8 million 10 years ago to do that deal, which is totally undervalued, I think. Um, so now... Uh, they bought the whole property. Heineken sells, oh. sells yeah. Brooklyn Beer in Japan and everywhere else. Right. But now, I knew seven years ago when, when Tuttletown was... I was there the day they were signing the papers. I was there, I showed up to do something and and the news, news, news anchors are there, and there's everything, and they're signing papers, and I talked to the son, Gabe, and he said what was going on. I go, are they buying you? He goes, 
not yet, he goes, but it's in the contract at some point down the road, they have an option to buy everything we have here. But for the next seven years or so, they just have the sales rights for these couple of right brands now, that we make. Everything, the property. They, they now own everything. everything. I just heard that. That's what I heard two weeks ago, oh, a week ago. I heard that now they own everything. everything. William Grant they owns. They had to redo the whole contract and everything. Really? Okay. So that so. Wasn't, supposedly wasn't in the original contract. Well, I was told the day of the signing that that was in the original yeah. contract. It was what I was told. I was there seven years ago for the signing. I saw it go down. And I asked a lot of questions. They go, so it's in there for the future. If they want to buy everything, they have an option in seven years to buy everything. And I guess they exercise that option, and they did it. Um, so now I have to think, okay, what's William and Grant going to change about Tuttletown? They want to make it a destination from Brooklyn. They want to make it a destination place to go to. But my feeling is, okay, they're here, they're local, but there's a lot of other local stuff that really we should support as well. And we do support it, other local stuff. So, you know, it's, it's something that we have to toy around with and say, well, what, what, are, what are the impacts of William Grant owning the property 100%? Absolutely. You know, hopefully they're going to keep the production there. Hopefully they're going to keep people employed locally and still doing sourcing the same stuff. It's going to grow. Yeah. Yeah, is I mean, there, that, that's, that's what they were bought for. They were bought there, to grow. Is their idea so that they can now produce more? Yeah, well, that's the idea why we're... Buy more. That's why every company buys another company, because they know that they can take it and blow it up. Right. So are they going to be able to blow it up in that property? I don't know. Are they going to have to make it somewhere else? Yeah. It's a big property. Who knows? The issue right. that I have with that is when, when suppliers are acquired by larger suppliers, they, those, those products, whether it's a, a tequila or a whiskey or a vodka or whatever it is uh, that, that grows and becomes popular and makes a name for itself, it, it reaches that level of success for a reason. And a lot of times when they're acquired, um, they'll jack the price up because you know of the supply and demand. But that price point is a big part of the reason why it became successful as well as the quality. So hopefully the quality and the... <laughs> well see, every, something always see, changes, right? Always. Like, like Budweiser claims oh, we, we, InBev, we're gonna buy Goose Island, we buy whoever, nothing changes. But you look at what happened with Goose Island, yeah, they kept the owner on as the president of Goose Island for, I don't like know, maybe- The face of the company or something? The face of the company, be the face of the company. But you know what? He can't buy staples from the local supply store down the street. He has to go through Budweiser's, InBev's corporate purchasing. So he can't purchase anything from locally anymore. It has to go through, that, through their official distribution cycles. And the first thing they did was they took their 312 beer, which was their most popular beer, and they shipped it to New York to be made. So they took it out of the distribution, out of that brewery, because they yeah. their goal I'm from, is, I'm from Chicago. Three three one two is huge. Though. Yeah, their goal is to grow that brand, and they can, couldn't grow Goose Island in the current facility with the three one two brand with what they wanted to, because now they're going to get three one two in every SKU they have across the country. Budweiser, that's their goal. So it got shipped to New York, and it's yeah. being made in New York to three one two. So things do change, folks. Things one hundred percent do change. When Budweiser was bought by by InBev, when it became InBev, and they were bought out. Uh, they stopped using the same uh, rice, the rice producer that they were, the Beechwood guy. Beechwood guy that supplied Budweiser for like 80 years or 100 years went out of business. He said, we're not buying Beechwood from him anymore. We have our own corporate supplier at Beechwood. And they used to buy like whole rice uh, for their beer. Now they would buy uh, broken rice and it came from a different supplier. So the product didn't, they, they initially cut corners and, and everywhere they could from paper staples to the Beechwood to the rice they were using, but the price never dropped in the store. Mm -hmm. If anything, it went up, mm -hmm. and all they were able to do was make more profit. A lot, a lot of times, the investors with things like that, well, they want their money back as soon as possible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, you're forcing people to spend more money and, and order a lot more product than they're comfortable with. I, that, at least, that's been my experience with mm -hmm. with some of the national brands or smaller brands that became made a name for themselves and, and became acquired. So, all right, folks. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Leave your favorite tequila below. What are you drinking on Cinco de Mayo? Hey, if you're in Ellenville, come by here. We have Anthony, uh, Anthony's Live at 7 p.m. We have $5 margaritas. Um, and margaritas. Our house margaritas are $5. And we, got, of course, got a lot of great, awesome tequila. Later.